All right, hello everyone and welcome to IR Talks at Bilkent. Today we have the honor of hosting Professor Akunver from Qatar House University. Uh, I will let our colleague Efe Tokdemir introduce him and then the floor will be his. Uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Hojan. Uh, thank you very much, Akunojan, for being here, and thank you very much, everyone, for again uh, being here to listen to Akunoja. Um, let me briefly introduce you, uh, Akunoja. Dr. Akunumer is an associate professor of international relations at Kadir House University, specializing in conflict research, uh, computational methods, and digital crisis communication. He earned his PhD at the University of Essex, Department of Government in England. He's a research associate at the Center for Technology and Global Affairs in Ox Oxford University and a, res a senior research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. He is also the Istanbul organizer of Summer Institute in Computational Social Science in case you will be interested uh, at some point. The Dr. Inver has so far published in Foreign Affairs, Diplomat, Journal of International Affairs, Middle East Quarterly, Middle East Policy, and Yale Journal of International Affairs. And he's the recipient of Gebip Awards uh, in 2019 and very recently Bagap Award in 2021. Uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, Akunojan. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ojan. It is Ojan. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining as well. Uh, I didn't expect this many people. This is this is so exciting. But I also realized that this is the last day uh, before the full lockdown. So I'm grateful that you're here. But I'm going to use your time very economically and do this very quickly so that you can all go out and enjoy the sun uh, for a little while. Um, the topic of my presentation today is um, this chapter I'm writing with my co-author Ahmed uh, Kurnaz um, for an edited volume that's coming up from uh, Oxford University Press's um, special series on uh, Royal Society um, in pr proceedings. It's basically about um, migration, which is really not my um, topic, but uh, the, the you know topic of the book um, is using data science for migration monitoring, basically how to use um, you know, social media and emerging technologies to better understand migration flows and everything that happens around uh, migration flows. So just like us in uh, the conflict studies, we're very interested in you know, micro level data because um, we're very, very much interested in you know, as, you know, granular data as possible. The same goes for migration people, essentially. Um, they want to not only understand, you know, the general direction in which the migration flows, they're also very interested in um, what happens within the, you know, uh, migrating group. So um, that's why they're basically um, publishing this book about how to use social media um, to explain extract more information and more data from within, uh, you know, migrating populations, uh, both like migration that is forced migration, but also, you know, general human mobility um, kind of thing. So my chapter, the one that I'm writing with Ahmed Kurnaz is um, to basically introduce uh, the world of conflict event data sets for migration scholars, um, but also kind of do a test um, of uh, a project that has that I've been doing for the last four years, um, you know, trying to leverage social media data, not just Twitter, but also you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, and all of the you know ecosystem of social media data, um, in order to get again more granular data from war zones, uh, you know, areas that are difficult to access. So generally speaking, you know. This, this chapter, because it's written for graduate students and newcomers to the field, I'm going to show you a little bit about um, you know, what we're doing there. Um, but the chapter introduces you know, the most frequently used data set, UCDP, PRIO, ACLED, which I'm going to touch upon uh, right now. But also it employs, um, it does an empirical test. Um, we basically, um, create an entity recognition and extraction algorithm. I'm going to tell you what that means very shortly. Uh, in order to build an automated system, 
which in real time extracts social media data from um, a specific coordinate area that I define. Um, it cleans that data automatically again based on redundancy checks and testing whether you know uh, there's any redundancy in the data and automatically logs that data in as conflict event data. So the chapter that we're writing is, is this really better compared to UCP Prio, ACLED, or a whole bunch of other data sets that are being very frequently used? And uh, the result that we have is yes and no, <clears throat> meaning that um, our algorithms uh, are definitely better than UCDP, but in you know, meso level, mid range level, ACLED is better than us. But at the micro level, our algorithm is better than ACLED, which is like the best uh, at this moment. So it's a very promising finding. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit about um, that project. But since we agreed to do this talk um, to a you know, generalist student, mostly audience, I want to explain to them briefly um, about what the hell am I doing? So um, just like briefly introducing um, my research um, topic to everyone. Um, so that is basically what I'm doing. I'm interested in people with weapons that are taking selfies. So this uh, project started as um, the selfies project, which I started at Oxford. Um, it was like very interesting, um, but then it kind of expanded into the whole domain of uh, you know what kind of information do militants share. And here a big disclaimer, um, especially today, the presentation that I'm going to do is not theoretical. It's not even like um, you know an actual paper presentation. It's uh, basically a research agenda presentation, and it's very methodologically oriented. So my talk is, you know, fully methodology. There's like no story, no, you know, theoretical anything yet. But from this, um, this is going to branch out into several theoretical um, papers. One of those is our recent um, Tubitak project, which Efehoja is also um, a part of, you know, computational uh, rebel diplomacy uh, project. But today, I'm. this is all about uh, methodology. So, uh, what, you know, we have th these things called conflict event data sets, you know, th that um, basically log um, every single conflict or violent event that's happening uh, in a particular date. Um, these um, projects are usually very crowded. They have assistants, they have researchers, they, they have region coordinators. And every single day, uh, they monitor, um, you know, open source, uh, um, you know, data so like newspapers, like no local newspapers, um, and try to get, um, you know, specific conflict uh, event data and sort them according to protest, bombing, terrorist attack, violent event, whatever. One of the most popular ones and recent one is ACLED, Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. They have a nice dashboard. So we have a lot of students in this uh, audience. So they, you can all go and like play with the dashboard. It's very fun. Um, we have, of course, one of the oldest um, projects around Uppsala Conflict Data Program, UCDB data. And they basically combine with Peace Research Institute of Oslo. They create UCB Prio. Um, data program. We have you know, University of Maryland's global terrorism database. You know, th these have been around for quite a while. Um, and uh, it, they basically helped us build the literature on you know, micro dynamics of violent events, uh, basically. Um, and for students, you know, what do these conflict data sets look like? They actually look like this. These are comma separated values, CSV um, documents. Um, and when you uh, open them on Excel, it basically you know, shows like that. So you basically take it either to Stata or SPSS or R or Python, whatever fancy um, interface that you're using and do quantitative analysis out of uh, conflict data. So why am I so obsessed with social media um, data? So one, um, it has very low 
uh, entry barriers. Uh, previously, when you wanted to do rebel diplomacy, you had to have access to some sort of radio station, TV station, or some kind of printing infrastructure in order to um, do propaganda. Now, you only need um, you know, one smartphone with um, a nearby 3G access, and you're all set, basically. Um, and so it basically enabled sub-state actors to cheaply conduct global level propaganda. So talk about really like low entry barriers. Um, it is good and bad because yes, we find lots of information from social media about war and these rebel groups, but there's also so much uh, miscommunication and disinformation there as well. So there is a separate research agenda uh, in social media data analysis on how to deal with this disinformation. Um, it has mixed results on recruitment. So why would people, why would violent groups use social media? Because it enables them to hire more people or attract more support. But the level of support is not always high quality. So it basically gives uh, mixed results. And, but it's very good for researchers because it provides us with the ability to gather really large volumes of granular micro level um, data. And you don't have to do quantitative, you can also do digital ethnography and basically do qualitative work um, out of these social media um, data. Um, so far, one of the biggest um, questions that we have in the literature is does social media affect conflict intensity onset? Um, there's currently no relationship. So there are lots of theoretical questions here um, that I want to explore. But basically, what do we have as social media data? You know, what, what, what kind of data um, do we get? Um, since the onset of social media, uh, the, the common um, expectation was um, because it's a war zone, um, combatants would keep their positions, their arms, their, um, you know, location secret, so they wouldn't use social media data. The exact opposite happened. We have tons and tons of data flowing in from uh, conflict areas. Whenever a group goes out to do like an armed clash, they take a selfie, they take a photo, they take a video. Whenever they're at their base chilling and just eating, they take selfies, they take photos. When they're firing an artillery, they're taking selfies, they're taking photos. So both militaries and non-state rebel groups use social media incredibly frequently. So uh, at the start of this project, uh, you know, four years ago, I was very um, you know, skeptical of saying that we probably won't find enough data, but we actually end up finding more data than we know what to do with. And uh, basically, apart from um, just selfies, these social media posts contain very elaborate texts, uh, especially in places like Instagram and Facebook, which doesn't really um, you know, give you a word limit or a character limit like Twitter does. So we basically get extensive, extensive texts from within group uh, groups um, that tell us what that group is trying to do, why they're fighting, what is their you know, um, ways of generating resources, what are their grievances, what are their opportunities. So they gave us a lot of textual data, a lot of visual data in order to test uh, existing theories on you know, microdynamics um, of conflict. And very interestingly, the majority of social media data that we get from conflict zones have location information on. Now, this is one of the most interesting and important, I think, um, dynamics that I see in a war zone, which is, you know, what is your expectation? You would think that these people turn off location information and whenever they're, you know, publishing something online, they wouldn't use their actual location, like the geotag uh, data, but they do, they do it very frequently. And um, basically, um, you know, time after time, different kind of studies tr try to focus on why do these rebel groups consistently turn on their location data on when posting something. Um, and we have different explanations. This is not properly theorized yet. So that's uh, a paper that 
uh, I have uh, you know, in my mind, but um, most of the time they turn on location information um, because of two things. One, if they hide their location information, it signals weakness. This is a very strange dynamic, but if they turn off their location information, they're interpreted as you know, being very weak and uncomfortable with their strategic situation. So uh, they turn on their location data specifically to signal the other side, other groups or state actors saying that I feel strong. I feel so strong that I turn on my social, uh, my um, uh, location data on. If you like, just come and attack me kind of daring uh, kind of thing. It's a very interesting dynamic, but um, as a result, not only that I get a lot of texts uh, or images or videos, but I get also a lot of location data, more location data that I would normally find from within a city. For example, if I get data from Istanbul and try to measure you know, purchasing behavior um, in relation to the proximity of shops to my house, I need location data and social media is a very good source for that. But in cities, I get maybe 3% or 4% of the actual data um, with location information on. In a war zone, I get around 60 to 65%, which is enormous. It gives me the sense that these people use location as a deliberate signaling uh, mechanism, which is very interesting. So we have, yeah, like chilling with the boys. We have like propaganda or whatever. So um, these are, you know, you know some of uh, the um, you know, commonly occurring data types uh, that we have. Um, this is not related to um, this presentation, but long story short, um, basically uh, several years ago, people uh, invented ways to automatically you know, use machine learning uh, in order to uh, recognize brands and specific um, items like you know, guitar or um, you know, a hat or something from uh, you know, social media uh, image <clears throat> and basically build algorithms to do that. Um, I'm now trying to set up a new project which maybe uh, tries to automatically detect weapons from a selfie, but that's um, a, a different project. So, so basically, how do we get data from uh, a conflict zone? We basically... Um, introduce coordinates first we we need to have a specific um you know coordinate requirement <clears throat> in uh place so that <clears throat> we don't get um, data from another part of the world related to syria violence or iraq violence i i want data from within iraq and within syria i also have a side project on ukraine um, and in my first project I used images taken with the front camera. Now, when you take a photo from your smartphone, um, the metadata of that um, image that you take contains information uh, about the specific model <clears throat> of the phone that you use. Um, it's IMEI code and basically whether it was taken with the front camera or back camera. It, it also contains metadata about the hardware that you use. So, when I extract them from social media, uh, I also get these images uh, with the metadata, uh, you know, saying that whether it was taken with the front or back camera. And uh, basically I do entity extraction. Entity extraction, these are basically named entities that specify things such as person, places and organization. So I have a data set of 14 million tweets and I want um, to extract um, you know, data uh, from the social media text that contain, you know, Bilkant or related uh, terms. So Bilkant or, you know, name of one of the cafeterias there or, you know, a landmark in Bilkant, for example. So I built a corpus, um, a text corpus that basically um, gives me um, every trigger word that relates uh, to Bilkant. I build that, you know, myself. Then, I basically do a redundancy check. I want to reduce multi-language reports into one single report because I'm trying to find a conflict event data and I need one reporting of one single incident. 
usually in a war zone, you get one single incident reported several times in different languages by different people. So my first level of defense is to reduce multiple language reports into a single report. <clears throat> level two, I want to get rid of this information as much as possible. So I use automated reverse image search on Google and Image Raider, which gets an image and tests it <clears throat> to um, you know, the internet database, whether it can find that image uh, in the internet database. You also have this, um, you know, uh, you know, feature in Google Chrome um, when you right click on an image that you find online, uh, when you basically click on reverse image search on Google, it gives you whether that image is really genuine and new or whether it's something that has been shared before. Um, and the third level of verification is human verification. So I'm looking at rebel groups, armed groups. So when, for example, you're dealing with Kurdish groups, parastin, which means protection, is a term that comes up very frequently. So when I, when my machine learning classifier hits that parastin term, uh, it doesn't understand whether it's parastin, parastin uzanyari, which is a different group, yekineyan parastin again, which is a different group. Or it's a generic group, you know, a bunch of kids that establish a group that contains Parastin term, or Parastin as a word meaning to protect. So it's 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 a, it's very difficult. In that sense, I need human verification at the last um, level. So basically, first thing is data cleaning. The second part is trying to build a corpus of events and words. I need a date range. I need. Uh, to specify based on countries. And I need to build one corpus on event types, such as aerial attack, arm clash, border incident, chemical attack, drone strike. Every term that would correspond, every word combination that would give me the sense that, oh yes, this word combination belongs to an aerial attack, or this word combination belongs to um, pipeline attack, or this word combination belongs to kidnapping. Um, the most labor intensive parts of uh, building these kinds of event det detection mechanism is to build these corpus uh, words. And it takes months and months and months and months. And, um, you know, side notes to uh, FAO Jam, this is where we are in our project right now. So get ready uh, to do these things. Uh, so uh, then you basically build another corpus of words that belong to groups. This is for Kurdish armed groups specific, but I also have a you know project on ISIS. Uh, I also have another project on Ukrainian militant groups. So you can actually use this model uh, and reapply uh, on other groups, changing you know not changing the event types, but for of course when you're looking for a border clash. Uh, and related terms in Ukrainian, you need different languages. You need a different language specialist. If you're doing it in Iraq, you need you know different language terms in that sense. And basically, you use groups, um, you use names, and uh, we were submitting this project um, with um, a group of my friends that once established uh, a company. That company is no longer. Uh, in effect, they were called uh, Iklim. They were a really good company, but whatever. Uh, we won an award with this project in, back in 2015. So we created this like fancy visualization um, for uh, you know public relations purposes. You know, look what how what what cool. But I mean, this is a very nice visualization. But long story short, this is actually um, a time series um, graph of events, violent events that we automatically get from social media data that happens on the Iraq-Turkey pipeline uh, region. And it be you know, road accident, shooting, explosion, aerial attack, assassination, roadblock, kidnapping. So every um, you know, violent event type that I detected, that happens along the way of the Botash uh, terminal and uh, the Iraq-Turkey pipeline you know back then we were using um this technology in order to <clears throat> you know sell our services to <clears throat> excuse me oil companies but basically um 
you know, that project is no longer in place, but this gives you, you know, what kind of visualization you can create out of this. <clears throat> so raw data um, looks like this, basically. This is, you know, raw, uncleaned data without any cleaning. That is why you have, you know, events that pop up in the sea. Of course, there is no violent ISIS event in the sea. These are location-wise raw data. These are not, a, you know, clean yet. But when you get, you know, social media data with your classifiers, and if you don't clean, you basically get something like this. Um, and you know that this is not yet good data for research and uh, analysis because you get, you know, uh, stray points of the seas and relatively. But interestingly, clusters tell you a lot of stuff, even without cleaning. I understand that there is something big happening here. This road is somewhat important. This cluster is probably very important. And essentially, this area is very... So even before cleaning the data, I get a lot of, you know, they trend data uh, from clusters uh, in the first place. And one very interesting uh, anecdote for you, um, we were working with a group of uh, physicists friend when I was at the Allen Turing Institute. And we said, you know, let's play with ISIS data for a while, ISIS territorial control data for a while. And some of our you know, physicist friends um, said that, let's use some between the centrality measure I said, what is between the centrality? I'm a social scientist, like speak to me in you know, social science. Or, and it, basically they told me that, you know, between the centrality is uh, a measure of uh, the center of gravity of any event that um, you're trying to look for, which means that um, their hypothesis was if we use between the centrality on ISIS violent event data, uh, we would get their center of gravity and <clears throat> we would define the center of gravity as the last stronghold uh, where ISIS would um, defend, you know, do its last stand. And this was in 2016. This was crazy talk at that time. Um, but nonetheless, this was an interesting idea. We ended up winning another award for this specific project using between the centrality to, you know, um, you know, hypothesize where ISIS is going to do their last stand. But interestingly enough, I don't have that um, yet, but they hypothesized that there would be, there would be a city here. Um, I forgot the name of the town, um, but when you Google the term called ISIS last stand, this town emerges. And, you know, three years later, we looked up on New York Times and discovered that, wow, like ISIS really did its last stand in this actual town. So uh, you can do a lot with this um, kind of data. And, you know, I reapplied this saying that, can I do uh, the same thing on Ukraine? I got even more data and even more granular data. It basically gives me, um, you know, battle zones, very clearly. This is also, you know, dirty data. It's not clean yet. So that's why you have tons of stuff um, you know, on the sea and in the Azov Sea, but look at the trend, like look at the cluster uh, trends here. It basically gives you a lot of stuff in terms of, uh, you know, where the fighting is actually happening. And even without cleaning the data, um, these were the most granular um, battlefield event maps that you could find even better than, I don't know, the th maps that NATO uh, had um, prepared. Then, you know, this is not really uh, related, but then I applied natural language processing on ISIS text because their social media text contains, you know, huge amounts of, um, you know, text information. So I'm basically trying to find out um, whether um, I can get, um, you know, kind of ideological or linguistic trends uh, within ISIS social media data. Um, somebody is... Oh, okay. Yeah, I just checked out the chat. Um, so what I'm basically trying to do is, um, you know, can I use ISIS text in order to build an ISIS dictionary or ISIS vocabulary dictionary? You know, which terms they use the most, at what time they use these words the most. First, I, um, you know, I taught our classifier how ISIS 
speaks through looking at their magazines, you know, Dabek, which was published 2014, 2016, Rumia magazine from 5th of September, 2016, 2017, and they have a whole bunch of new magazines. So first, I basically took all of those uh, articles and Stefan, I think, was part of this project. Uh, the, the, um, this, um, these magazines were, um, the machine learning couldn't classify because if you can see my you know, pointer here, it reads this entire line as a single line, whereas this is, you know, these are columned lines. It has to read like this, but it ends up reading the entire line. So what we did is that I uh, basically found some volunteers and Stefan was one of those. Uh, and we basically copy pasted the entire texts into word format and started teaching our machine learning classifier on how uh, ISIS speaks basically. Then we used these classifiers to detect ISIS text from a broader range of um, tweets and texts and Facebook messages, Instagram posts from Syria and Iraq. Um, and it basically gave us, um, you know, topic models, basically the topics in which ISIS is speaking. So one topic that comes up really frequently is, you know, targeting language. The second one is religious theological language. The third topic is gender language, you know, women and the role of women in ISIS, whatever. Uh, so then we basically have, you know, dyadic um, topic clusters. But so this is where I'm coming from. So now I'm going to switch to the actual paper uh, that I'm going to present. But um, just to give you a general sense to, um, you know, our friends that are students here that may not be uh, familiar with, you know, what uh, is going on. Uh, this is where this whole project is coming from. Now, let's move on to the actual um, paper, uh, which I'm going to share um, very soonish. Let me share this. Um, so I, I haven't prepared um, any slides for that. So I'm basically going to go through um, the paper uh, directly. So I'm doing this project with Ahmed Krunas from Chakra and Smart University and Ultra Internet Institute. Um, so the, the title of the paper is Conflict and Forced Migration Social Media as uh, Event Data. So how, how well we can use uh, social media uh, as a substitute of um, you know, things like UCDP, ACLED, um, these are really like two of the most frequently used um, data sets that are like very broad. Um, I start with uh, a section on <clears throat> uh, biases in social media data, because when we're doing social media data, yes, it's promising, of course, we have so much data and we get them so easily and we can play with that data in any form that we'd like, but there are implicit biases that go with social media data. One is availability bias, meaning that we only get violent event data from uh, violent groups that actually have a lot of cell phones and access to cell phone towers. That is one tricky thing, which means that <clears throat> the more cell phones a group has and closer it is to a cell phone tower, the more violent event data we get from them, which really skews the whole represent representativeness distribution of the kind of events um, that come. We get more events from groups that have these capabilities and fewer uh, data from groups that don't have these capabilities. Yes, in the last two to three years, this is less of a bias because everyone has a social media account and access to cell phone towers, whatever now. But about three years ago, four years ago, we actually didn't. And the problem with this is in a war zone, things like cell phone towers or communication towers get destroyed the first. So getting social media data in a war zone from social uh, cell phone towers um, sometimes creates a lot of biases. So people have to be very aware of um, that availability bias issue. 
then we go on to discuss off the shelf conflict uh, event data sets you know what what can you have um, right off the shelf uh, ready data sets just download them in csv format and do whatever analysis that uh, you're doing of course at the top we have ucdp prio and i think this is good for like our student friends that are listening to this if you want to to conflict research um, you can go, you know, explore these conflict event data sets. UCDP Prio, ACLED is one. Starts Global Terrorism Data Set is one. Global Data Set, uh, set uh, Global Database of Events Language and Tone Project is also one very important um, project. IQs, an Integrated Crisis Early Warning System, um, is very important as well. X sub, um, you know, Zukov, Davenport, and Kostchuk. Um, this is basically a meta uh, data set that combines existing data sets into one single you know, searchable format. There are also um, project specific data sets, data sets that were created for one particular project or one particular paper. paper. You know, social conflict analysis database, SCAD is one, mass mobilization data pro project is one. Integrated network for societal conflict research is one. Sexual violence in armed conflict is another one. Now, this gives us um, the sense that there are so many data sets. So if these data sets are so good, why do we need so many? And the question is, <clears throat> each data set has a different measurement type, uh, measurement criteria, uh, and or uh, the type of um, data that they process, the period, period, periodization that they do, um, the level of analysis, you know, active specific or system specific. So that's why usually uh, it's very really good to familiarize oneself with as many <clears throat> data sets as possible. Now, the rest of the chapter is about let's try to build our own you know, extract social media as conflict event data. Let's create our own data sets. Um, because most of the time, especially if you're doing a micro level conflict analysis on a very recent conflict, which is happening like right now, or which began a month ago, chances are, you know, UCDP is disappointing in general, but ACLED also is very slow in um, trying to, um, you, know, you know, create sufficient data in a way. So most of the time, what um, yeah, doctoral students do in these kinds of situations, that they always you know, start working on their own um, data set. Um, but we already know how Athlete UCDP does these things. They use media data, of course, like they don't go there and they, they, they don't measure violent events on the front lines. They also you know, do abstractions and use me media data. So let us do uh, media analysis, social media analysis, and let's try to build um, our uh, own data sets. And here I discuss a little bit about um, coding systems, you know, how these you know, event data sets began, what kind of coding systems um, that they do, um, the, the same, um, you know, figure, in, you know, the same, um, you know, extraction uh, criteria that I mentioned to you. I also, you know, I'm writing here, whatever. This is um, a standard sample workflow. It's basically, you introduce a radius, you introduce a date range, you introduce a specific location or do a radius analysis, or you set frames into the geography and basically, you know, introduce, you know, four, uh, coordinate systems and get data from there. You filter them based on violent event corpus, actor keywords, do automated translation redundancy check, automated visual redundancy check, reverse image and video verification, create and transform variables and parse them into a new data set by location, event type, and actor type. Um, and here, let's focus on the results. Um, a little bit. Let me also zoom in as much as possible so that you also can see um, these things. Now, this is 
um, a violent, let me see, let me look at this. So regional level, top to bottom, Twitter ex extraction output, UCB, Prio, and applet. So, okay, the top one is the result of our algorithm. So the tents that you see are refugee uh, camps, uh, locations which we got from UNDP data set. And the dots that you see are violent events that we extracted um, during one of Turkey's uh, cross-border operations. Um, so it is fine. Um, it is well represented. Yes, these each, each dot represents a social media data. This is clean data, uh, which is why you don't have anything like in the seas. Um, then the second line, we have UCDP data. It's also pretty good, like when we compare it to our um, data. It's quite representative. It is very rich. It's, um, it contains quite valuable inf information. But of course, ACLED is king in that regard. In regional uh, level, ACLED is really good. Like we couldn't beat ACLED in region level data. It's very, very good. Uh, it's very clean. They have tons and tons of researchers and tons and tons of interns. And it shows that, that kind of resources and that kind of investment gives you very good data. But let's look at region, you know, micro level. Let, this, is, this is focusing on Afrin, uh, the town Afrin specifically. Um, so this is us, our Twitter data extraction. There is something that happens in that lake, something that happens in this neighborhood, something that happens in this road, something that happens here. So yeah, fine-ish. I wish we had more granular data, but it's good enough, especially when you compare it to UCDP. You only have one single dot, which means that we beat you UCDP, but let's look at Aklet. We also beat Aklet as well. Aklet has one here and one uh, something irrelevant here. So now I understand that doing social media as conflict event data is very, very promising at the very micro level, district level, neighborhood level. It's very, very good. Let's look at numeric data. Let's, let's compare them actually numerically, not just geographically. So, um, fit this here more. So here we have ACLED, here we have Twitter data, which is our algorithm. Here we have UCDP. Now, in terms of the wider Operation Olive Branch region, again, ACLED is quantitatively better. It's like very, very good. UCDP, less good. Our algorithm is okay somewhere in the middle. Um, here, it may look like there's not much difference between ACLED and Twitter, but we realize that when we introduce um, specific events, such as downing of Turkish advancement, Syrian National Army advancement, um, clearing of the Turkish border, um, with the exception of Afrin captured, with the rest of the events, Twitter data is actually slightly better compared to now, this is promising. Why? This is promising because ACLED is a multi-million dollar project. Our Twitter data set was created uh, when we were eating two simits and the cheese, right? So in terms of resources, um, there's nothing uh, that compares. We basically ran this model in just like a week um, and get these results compared to its dedicated data set project that uses millions and millions of, not dollars of, of course, but euros. Now, if we had um, about a quarter of those resources and more time in our hands, we would basically uh, get, give, get the best conflict event data um, out there. And it's automated. You don't even need tens, tens of thousands of people. So I finish this section with a brief discussion of um, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of um, using social media data. Again, some warnings about um, um, data bias uh, and whatnot. Um, but this is basically um, the chapter. It's, it's quite, I think, um, promising uh, way ahead. And um, the reason why I'm so happy that we are doing this um, Chivitak project right now 
uh, is that we um, we can actually have resources and you know people in place to explore these topics um, you know further um, and deeper. Hopefully, we, we will modify um, and polish um, these algorithms and these you know data extraction models. Um, that one day we're going to beat ACLED, hopefully. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I don't want to uh, stretch my time uh, too much. Uh, so if you like, let's go into the Q&A session. So Akunajan, do, do you simply say robots will gonna beat people someday? Yes and <laughs> no. I mean, yes, in terms of robots are definitely going to beat people in uh, jobs that require redundancy, <laughs> boring jobs. So uh, in, in like when we compare uh, 100 assistants working every single day, you know, parsing, you know, newspaper articles or reports, whatever, a computer is going to do that much better because one, um, it is like, because it's automated and because it's, it uses the same algorithm, um, there is no intercoder reliability bias thing. It's like the same algorithm. Uh, when you're using 100 coders, you also have to test whether you know um, it's the, the intercoder reliability is there or not. Uh, one day, <clears throat> uh, I definitely think that. But you're in this too. You have to support this. Uh, you have to support this campaign because you know you're in this too now. So uh, hopefully, at the end of the third year, we we will we we will be beating everyone. Great. So I will be moderating the session, the Q and A. We have already a couple of questions in chat and also uh, a few hands up. Uh, one of our students was very eager to ask a question. She's gonna have to leave at one uh, thirty. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with her. Uh, Edjem, would you like to ask your question? I wonder if she's still here. Okay. Um, let me... Edjem is here, I guess. I am here. Okay. So do you want to go ahead since you're you're still here? All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Inver, uh, I would like to thank you for this beautiful seminar. I also attended another in, uh, IR seminar uh, held by uh, our instructors. And uh, actually, her uh, presentation was also about social media and terrorism. Actually, she stated that uh, the advertisements and using the pictures of female fighters uh, for propaganda is quite common in violent non-state actors such as uh, YPG. However, you also state that violent language in the social media posts uh, are also common, such as the pictures with guns and the location to demonstrate power and aggressiveness. So my question is that actually why there are possible differences with the usage of social media tools uh, between uh, the violent non-state state actors themselves? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, very good. Um, <clears throat> One, I don't know, because that's what the current project is about. Like, that's the question that we're trying to explain. Uh, you, I, I think 100% ask the question that we ask in our project proposal. Hopefully, um, you're going to answer it in three years. Time. In three years, yeah. <laughs> ask us in three years. No, because that's a very important question. Like, what, what explains the differences between how groups, the way is it ethnicity, ideology, access to cell phone towers, uh, whether they're in, whether, whether they're winning, whether they're losing, whatever. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't know. That's what our project is all about. Um, and uh, I don't even want to give like a hypothetical answer because uh, the kind of research that happens in this uh, literature, like, um, like terrorism and political violence, studies and conflict terrorism, there are lots of social media articles on that regard, but they always focus on one single group. So we don't have, um, to the best of my knowledge, there was one paper that was that focused on ISIS and another jihadi group. But of course, that's not enough to do comparison. Um, the literature is like quite empty in that field and like theorization um, is is not there. Um, so I, I don't I don't I can't even tell you anything that's been comparatively now. So that's our project. Um, 
you have to wait for well, at least two years until we uh, you know, find the data. But that's a very really important question. Yeah, I think that's that's um, uh, that's topic of several papers. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, the next person I have on my list is Mohammed. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Um, sure, yes. Um, so first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's really innovative way to research conflict. Um, so I have a I have actually two questions about how the algorithm works. First of all, them is um, to introduce uh, machine learning into your algorithm because it would speed up the process of analysis and you know existing filters and also add new filters. And my second question is um, about the temporality of the data. Do you just pin on the map um, like um, data over some period of time, or you? trace uh, certain users or certain groups of users over time because doing so might reveal some patterns of activity which would be i think very valuable intelligence data thank you yeah we definitely use machine learning both in terms of getting the data phase um, but also cleaning the data phase that's very important because um, yes, you need machine learning so that the algorithm recognizes what an, a violent event data looks like, but also machine learning um, algorithm should also identify uh, what the redundant data looks like. So it's, it's very important both in the data extraction phase, but also in the data cleaning phase. So we rely on that uh, very frequently. In terms of temporality, since we're extracting um, text, so there, there are different ways you can extract. One, you can extract with, by text, which is what I'm doing. But you can also extract um, by, for example, visually use um, you know, TensorFlow, you know, image or video recognition algorithms, and basically say that, you know, give me events that uh, where the machine can recognize an ISIS flag. So whatever, whichever social media, um, you know, um, whatever in which it identifies an ISIS uh, flag, for example, it's um, if you're using, for example, uh, when you're doing an analysis on um, the use of small arms in violent conflicts, you can basically feed your machine learning algorithm millions and millions of images of an AK-47 and it goes and recognizes the AK-47 and extracts uh, the information um, that contains AK-47. Like you can do extraction visually, you can do extraction textually, you can do extraction, um, you know, location-wise. You know, just give me all of the data that comes from Hama or Homs, for example. Uh, you can do temporarily, tempor temporarily, like you mentioned. Just give me data from this town for this particular week, but then you don't know which ones are violent event data, which one. Uh, belongs to a group of guys taking selfie, smoking shisha, and eating cake. So uh, you need some classifier to distinguish violent event data from just like regular social media posts of people that are chilling and hanging out. So, um, so far, what I discovered is that textual data is the best to do these kinds of extraction algorithms. Um, do I follow specific groups? No, because the project, in the, what, what I'm trying to do is to build a general view of conflict. If a group X comes in, Y comes in, A, B comes in, I want all of them. Uh, if I were an intelligence analyst, yet I would follow groups, but I'm not an intelligence analyst, so I'm trying to um, you know, create, um, you know, generalized knowledge out of these things. So what I'm looking at is not specific groups. I'm looking at specific action types and dynamics and what this tells us about conflict onset, conflict intensity, um, stalemates or conflict termination, or it's very really early to talk about it, but um, in the later phases of the Syrian civil war, I'll be using the same type of data extraction model to, you know, write papers on peace processes or uh, intercommunal um, I, like confidence building measures, for example. So uh, you just you know, change the textual format of your recognition algorithms. And that's how things work, for example, 
in consumer and market research as well, an entirely different discipline. Um, the, 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 the workflow doesn't change, but of course the content changes. And as a result, uh, you answer different questions. So I don't follow a specific group. If I were, for example, um, an, you know, an ISIS scholar that only focus on ISIS, yes, that makes sense. But if you're doing like a general um, conflict research, then um, no, you get data using text and then uh, you get data from as many different groups as possible. Thank you very much. We have another question from a student um, and he wrote it in chat. Honor John, would you like to ask your question out loud? Are you still with us? Let me check. Because we never, I mean, it's really hard when you have a large number, a large audience. Okay, he seems to be here. Uh, I will ask him to start video and also hopefully to ask his question. I hope he can. I hope there are no technical problems. Um, okay, background noise. So yeah. then I'll read it out. I'll, I'll read it. I'll read that. Okay. Uh, how do you avoid the algorithm being interrupted and lose accuracy if precautions are taken against the threat it predicted? Or does it not improve interrupt significantly? The only way this um, the only way this circus stops is when um, you know there are governmental restrictions on data, like Turkey bans Twitter or Turkey throttles Twitter or Facebook. The only kind of interruption happens around those times, and th 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 these things happen when we're around election periods. For example, the government you know throttles internet quite a lot around those periods. Second, when you know there's a protest somewhere else, like for example, Bozici protest, they throttle um, again. So that's only when um, um, the algorithm, it's not interrupted, it basically slows down. And of course, it's a big bummer. Uh, and it's one of these um, uh, you know, pitfalls of doing these kinds of research or social media research or internet research in general in a place like Turkey. But that's life. Um, also, how do you clean the data? Could you give a brief context about your methods? Um, you basically uh, clean data. I mentioned this uh, a little bit in uh, the early phase. So when you extract data, uh, it's raw. It's like crude oil. It's not ready for analysis. You have to refine it and you have to clean that data so that it becomes um, usable. One uh, way of doing data cleaning is reducing redundancies. One, uh, as I mentioned, in a conflict event setting, when somebody goes and kills somebody else, you have 1,000 reports of that same event. So what you're trying to do is to reduce those 1,000 events into one single event. Same goes for uh, the reporting of the same in incident in Farsi, in Arabic, in Kurdish, in Turkish. So you all have to reduce them into one single uh, uh, event and you can use machine learning uh, to do that. It works quite a lot. Uh, the second one is second type of cleaning is um, trying to find a way to get around the problem of disinformation. Disinformation happens very frequently in war zones um, because uh, it's all about you know psychological war as well. You share a video in which a rebel group shoots down a helicopter or a jet, it's good for morale. But what we see very regularly is that a video that belongs to Afghanistan in 2015 gets shared in Syria as if it was done like yesterday. So how you can manage these things is that you do things like reverse image search or reverse video search. Um, Google has these services, but there are also free um, services out there that you can use to do that, those guys. So it takes a photo, it automatically uploads it to um, a website. And if it finds the exact same photo in history, then it omits that as an event data because it's, it was shared before. If it can't find it in the history of Google, then it means that it's a new data. It takes it into, uh, of course, these um, these are still work in pro you know, progress things. So the more we work on this, the better they're going to get. 
And so far, these precautions are good enough. It's not perfect. Uh, they're good enough. It, they, they clean a lot of uh, disinformation or dirty data. Um, and finally, um, although we're using uh, machines, we still need uh, human specialists, people who actually speak the language of the region that we're studying or um, know the political and social context. And the one of the most frequent examples that I give, the problem that I uh, you know, witness, uh, if you're doing you know, Kurdish armed groups, you know, Paras in term came uh, a lot uh, in your data. And it's very difficult for a machine learning classifier to know whether Parastin belongs to this group, that group, because it's used um, very frequently. The same goes, I think, when you're looking at um, you know, Sunni religious groups and um, the, you know, jihad comes up in the name. Are we talking about like one jihadi group? That's another jihadi group. There are like dozens of jihadi groups. And also jihad is also a verb. So how do you separate and classify so you need a specialist. You need a specialist that comes up and says, oh, okay, this jihad belongs to this group. So this is basically how um, you uh, clean um, the data. Uh, it's still a work in progress, of course, but it actually gets rid of quite an overwhelming majority. I don't want to give percentages, but it gets rid of a lot of uh, the dirty data. Uh, um, so it's, it's actually uh, something that's very functional. Uh, we cannot hear you. Can you unmute? He's unmuted, but his mic doesn't work. It doesn't work now? Oh, okay, it does. Okay, I hope we can communicate right now. Uh, Elis Ojam, thank you for the uh, chance to ask a question. And Akun Ojam, thank you very much for your presentation. It was actually very intriguing for me. I'm uh, I had like seven questions, but I will just try to make them very short. Uh, just one, two of them. Uh, firstly, I wanted to ask you about uh, if you have any uh, dictionary projects that you are working with to have a database for language uh, identification instead of having uh, something that you're building on your own, but an internationally accessible uh, language dictionary for this kind of research. Uh, additionally, is there such a visual identification database that you can directly put into your work and then it can match visuals and uh, also text uh, in this sense? So you don't have to go with connotation understanding every time or rebuild your own database. Uh, additionally, I would like to ask, uh, how do you do the auto data collection from social media? Do you limit it with uh, geolocation and hashtags? Or do you have different uh, variables that you consider as limiting uh, visual, so, so, limiting data collecting uh, tool? And uh, lastly, I have a question on location data that you mentioned. Uh, the uh, insurgents are using this kind of data. And you said it's maybe because they want to avoid looking weak, but I mean, did this give their location, right? This is strategic damage, uh, harm for them. Uh, so. Do they get killed, the people who are sharing this kind of images? Do they get killed more frequent than the other ones or the ones that, that, that are in the picture? Because there is also intelligence work in the field as well. So mm. uh, what, what kind of thing goes with this data as well? Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, I will definitely forget some of your questions. So I'm going to ask you, um, I try to take notes, but I'll, I'll definitely forget. Um, since the last one is more difficult i'll start with that so uh, location information do they get killed yes the most famous one uh, belongs to an isis red bearded militant which um, got killed in 2014 when he um, posted on twitter that he was actually going to go blow up himself and then um, he got a drone strike about a minute later so um, uh, i think based on the kind of data that i'm I'm getting, um, nobody learned anything from that uh, incident, meaning that, well, yes, I'm using location data. I'm actually posting on Twitter that I'm going to blow up myself. And then a minute later, a drone comes in and blows me. So uh, probably I would expect some groups to learn from this and not do this. But no, they do it. They still do it. They specifically do what exactly they're going to do. They die as a result of it. 
Um, but I think this requires actually going and doing interviews with them, which I'm not going to do. If somebody else wants to do, please be my guest. But uh, you have to ask them, like, what is, what is the logic there? What's the cost benefit? Because I don't think they're not learning because the, in, in the learning in uh, a battlefield um, is quite extensive. Like, for example, groups learn how to do uh, public diplomacy or use social media. They learn that from themselves very fast. So I would expect they also learn that you shouldn't trumpet where you're going to attack. But the kind of data that I'm getting is that like it, it's very granular and they actually still trumpeted it a lot. And <clears throat> they not only get targeted by state actors, but they also get targeted by other groups. So I'm hypothesizing that there's some kind of um looking weak theme they're still playing more strongly compared to the potential that they may actually get killed so this requires some kind of interview um so how do i do automatic data uh extraction i think i use that i build a corpus uh you you say dictionary but we use basically a corpus and it has been uh being built um for about four years now like every single time um, a new event type happens we basically build 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 that into a word corpus i think that's what you mean by um dictionary although corpus method is different than dictionary um, method um and then of course the natural question is is there a visual database and is it an internationally accessible dictionary project database um, there is, but it's not internationally accessible. Um, do I want to make it accessible? Probably when I publish something um, substantial with it, yes, I'll probably do it. But I think for this to be talk project, I don't want to do this. I want to finalize this project and go for an ERC grant and do these things like a dictionary project and uh, into like a visual database kind of things because um, trying to build an internationally accessible visual and textual database like dictionaries um, uh, I, I, I'll only do it if I benefit from it substantially so uh, it, it's, it's either like a high impact publication or an ERC grant uh, only after that I'm going to open them up uh, uh, for but I, I also uh, in this chapter, in this specific chapter, I have a section on you know, how you can build your own dictionaries or uh, word corpus yourself. So I'm not being whole selfish. I also explain how um, it's done. Um, so uh, yeah, but in terms of like my specific dictionary that I have been building for years and years, no, I need, uh, I, I had to publish it in, in a good way so that I make it internationally accessible or it becomes an ERC project. So. Yeah, but that could be a linguistic project for every language and not uh, only limited to this project. But yeah, okay, I understand. Thank you very much. Uh, for yeah, but I think uh, in, in Koç Erdem, Yurik uh, Hoca has this project. Uh, their, <clears throat> pro their ERC project is uh, on emerging welfare, completely different question. But they also have um, a working dictionary project um, that, build, that, that basically brings in a lot of different international uh, researchers uh, to build an international database of protest events very close to what I'm doing. But they're doing protest events and they have uh, you know, different, um, you know, challenge hackathon kind of events. One is, uh, I think, in the coming weeks, um, they're looking for people to join that, you know, collaborative effort. Uh, their, their project has one on a global database of uh, protest events kind of thing they basically have they're cooperating with around like 50 to 60 people that are in this uh, project so uh, the, 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 the thing that fits closest to your definition is actually their project ERC uh, project on um, emerging welfare at coach thank you very much great uh, Honor John has another question Honor John please go ahead well, hi, Okan uh, Thank you for your talk, and I'm sorry I couldn't uh, turn on my mic before. Uh, I was wondering if uh, militaries in the world are uh, using similar algorithms 
uh, and if not, or if uh, you know of, uh, did someone from a military approach you to apply uh, this algorithm? Uh, someone from, the, I mean, in the United States, uh, in Great Britain, like in uh, countries that are more advanced with this kind of stuff, um, I'm pretty sure that they have like a lab that does these things. Um, in Turkey, to the best of my knowledge, um, they don't really understand what um, machine learning would do. They still have like human observers, but it's like, <clears throat> I don't think they have a specific um, like social media battlefield event or something. They have a monitoring, um, you know, they have a monitoring situation room in which um, they manually look at social media data. Uh, but of course, I don't know what um, they're doing. Um, but I, you know, my general goal out of all of this, like conflict event data or whatever, um, I think I want citizens and civilians to actually benefit from this, you know, rather than like intelligence or military. I mean, they already have tons of resources and enormous wealth um, to do whatever they want to do. Um, but I think what I'm trying to do is I want to like democratize battlefield events and make them publicly accessible uh, rather than, you know, have one military or another military benefit from it. Like I want to create an algorithm that basically um, brings the horrors of the war closer to public consumption. So that's basically my um, you know, overarching um, goal here so that people make better democratic decisions about um, why or how their countries get into conflicts. Um, I have one last question if there isn't uh, any. Uh, this question is uh, about quantitative methods in uh, social sciences in general. Uh, we know that there are many uh, graduate programs uh, on this um, topic uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, but there is no um, graduate program in Turkey uh, that I know of. Uh, is, there a, is there an upcoming one or is there a planned one that you know of um, that you could mm. share with us? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like out externally helping coach build one and they're the closest one to um, have that kind of thing. I think in their sociology department, not IR, but um, I think it's going to be um, it's going to be <clears throat> like a computational social science master's program. Um, it's going to be based in the sociology department, but it's going to be open for all social scientists. So um, at least based on the projects that I also contribute to, they're the closest ones um, in um, they, they're getting their like York clearance and whatnot at this point. So they would be the closest. Sabanja has one, but um, it's an undergraduate um, specialization track, which is not really a master's program. Um, you basically get um, an undergraduate specialization in computational social science, um, but it's not really a master's degree. There is a data science master's degree at Sabanja, but it's not really IR. It belongs to management and information sciences. But, but I think if like when, when, when we call it in a different way, not like, like computational social science, but when we call it social data science, I think the majority of management and information systems master's programs would um, actually do um, the same thing. So you don't really need a specialist program on computational social. It's good for marketing, but if you want to learn the tools, you can very easily go to any uh, management and information sciences master's program and learn um, these things. So um, we don't need to wait for coach. I'm pretty sure their program is going to be very good, but um, um, it's really about at one point like marketing and what it looks good on paper. Okay, John, thank you. Are there any other questions from uh, any of the participants? Well, I'm going to 
I don't see anyone and I don't have anything else in chat. I, I also had a ton of questions. I'm going to ask if, if I may the, um, the last one. Yep. So things we were talking um, in class about when we dealt with artificial intelligence is are the kind of biases that are embedded um, in algorithms simply because they are these algorithms are still human made and humans have um, a variety of, of biases, whether they are aware of them or not. So have you, um, have you, I mean, how, how do you deal with this, with this issue, if it is an issue in, in your work? The, the part about biases and artificial intelligence, we're not doing artificial, of course, like the kind of algorithms that we use are not as advanced as, uh, for example, if a computer scientist looks at what I'm doing, they're going to say, bah, we basically teach it in undergrad. And they do. Um, so the kind of artificial intelligence level algorithms that we're talking about are very extensive. They're like huge lines of um, code. And uh, of course, since um, the size of that code and size of those um, hypotheses that goes into that code, they're like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, those suggestions. It's, in, in that kind of a scale problem, of course, biases are inevitable, but in kind of a very like um, simple and very elementary algorithm that we use in this kind of project, um, it's very difficult to think of any embedding biases, but even if there is a bias, if somebody discovers and says that, well, have you considered that? It's very easy for us to correct for that because our code is actually very small. Um, and um, it's, it's very easy to fix those um, biases. Um, but usually bias, you, you become aware of the biases when somebody discovers that bias saying that, well, there's a bias because otherwise no programmer would code knowing that they're doing something that's biased, right? Every programmer programs something thinking that they're doing the best thing in the world and trying to account for that biases. But we become aware of the biases when either something bad happens or something um, that a specialist would say that, look, there's a bias in here. And then you discover that, oh, there's a bias there. So I don't know if our algorithm is biased. Nobody said that yet. But even if somebody said that, you know, this is bad, it's easier for us to correct this um, because the code you know, line is like very, it, it, it's, not, it's not a huge code, but um, it's far easier than correcting something, let's say like facial recognition algorithms, for example, which is very you know, large chunks of code. It's very difficult to fix um, in that sense. So I don't know if somebody has to say that, like this particular part um, is biased. And then of course, I'm happy to, uh, fix programs triggered. Yes, programmers triggered. Yeah. Thank you very much, Akin Hoja. Uh, so I don't know if there's anybody else who would like to ask anything. Uh, this is, let's say, the final call for today's yeah. session. Go enjoy the weather. Don't waste your time <laughs> on me. Just uh, no. This is this is really fantastic. We've it, it's such a, an enriching project, and we're really looking forward to seeing. Uh, the the final uh, output to reading the chapter in the volume, and and to getting a closer look of a very this very granular look at uh, very important events uh, through um, your project and and congratulations on all the prize you got uh, and all the grants to both you and Efe Hoja and we uh, keep our fingers crossed for you. So Akin Hoja, thank you so much for accepting our invitation for joining us today uh, and and telling us about your work. Uh, we hope to have you here in person, hopefully not too far from now when everybody's vaccinated and, yeah. and things get better and there's no lockdown. Until then, um, we hope you remain healthy and safe and, and have a very nice end of semester. You as well. Thank you so much for your invitation. Um, hope to see you all in the same auditorium, hopefully next year. Well, cheers for that. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank um, you. Great day, great. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Effa, for inviting uh, Akhaja. It was uh, an honor to host it. Thanks for organizing, Elisa. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.
Görüşürüz hocam. Görüşürüz. Bay bay.